wonder what led to where you are today? Like, what particular choice did you make or didn't make that put you on the path that you're on? Because I'm wondering what led to the point where I'm talking about an anime like Landlock. You picked it out at random. Oh. I've stressed before that there are many types of bad in this world, and no two ways are comparable to each other. Each brings uniqueness to the spectrum of quality, like a flayed-out poops watch, flashing the many shades of shit brown it holds. From the loose, watery Hershey squirts that burn upon exit, to the tar-black turds that you should probably see a doctor about. So where does Landlock lie on this menagerie of manure? Well, it's like the shit you took yesterday. Nearly forgettable in every way, and the only reason why it's taking up precious brain real estate is because you had to flush twice. And when I say forgettable, I truly mean it. Barely a mention on Anime News Network, none at all on Wikipedia, and the list of credits feature nothing but Alan Smithies. Hell, the credited screenwriter, and its only credit by the by, is just... Orca. The Jaws knockoff? No, wait, it's all in capital letters, so it's an acronym. Uh, Otter Research and Care Association? Oliver Reed's Cantankerous Ant, Oscar Recall for Crash at Once. Okay, I'm just giving this way more thought than it deserves. There's only one interesting thing about Landlock, and it's that Shiro Masamune did the character designs. Yeah, between penning his umpteenth porn book and collecting his Ghost in the Shell royalties, he managed to do some of the art for this OVA, and even when it's in the service of something this forgettable, his design work is always a welcomed sight. But the art and animation is where the lotting ends. Time to remind ourselves why we forgot about Landlock. Appropriately enough, we begin with a canned narration from our lead talking about how his father would prattle incessantly about war. My father was definitely a very eccentric person. And as a boy, I was too young to understand why my father constantly spoke about how and why wars began. Especially when we lived in the most beautiful and peaceful place in the world. The land of Zul. Ahem, that's Zul, motherfucker. Zul. He also had a unique talent. He was a master of the wind. Unfortunately, I lacked my father's ability when it came to controlling the wind's forces. Oh, for the... What is this? The third fucking anime in a row that's coaxing a last airbender reference from me? You know what? Fine. I got your last airbender reference right here, buddy! <laughs> oh, that's right, bitches. If at any time Landlock prompts me, you will get a face full of Shyamalan. Do you see what happens? Do you see what you get when you push the sage too far? So anyway, the narration continues, saying that he's become his village's leader and that destiny awaits him. But with that ordination, there came massive powers and a realization of the truth. It was on that same day, I lost the innocence of youth and became a man. <laughs> Reminds me of my own ordination. Wait, you're a priest. Oh God, I just got your soccer joke. We begin the story proper on a dark night as two guardsmen play Statler and Waldorf and punch holes into the story. I can't even understand what a user of the wind is or even does. Yeah, me neither. I hope he has what it takes to be a great leader. Yes, me too. Say, Sage! Yes, Gabe? What's worse than a poorly thought out story? Dialogue that points out how poorly thought out the story is? No! Herpy! I was wondering where I got it from! <laughs> <laughs> and right on time, the Fire Nation decides to launch their attack on the peaceful air nomads, causing our hero, Ain't, to race and find his hilariously designed father. Look at him, he looks like the last guy invited to the orgy in a 70s porno. Unfortunately, his mustache is overpowered by Vanessa Lewis here, and she soon finds his son... somehow. Like, really, she just dropped in on him, having no idea where he was, in the middle of the goddamn forest. <laughs> I found you! Finally found you, Red Eye! I never would have believed there was another, just like me. I always thought I was the only one with an eye like this. But he doesn't have an eye like that. His is red. Do you... Do you know what colors are, Vanessa? 
She certainly knows what black and blue are, as she just pummels poor Ain into the ground. And when his sister tries to make the save, Vanessa chick kicks her right off her bike and puts her lifeless body in a half Nelson. True, this does make our hero look like an absolute chump, but who says I gotta root for the baby face? Why, why are you... Why are you doing this to us? What do you want from us? Well, first of all, I came here to kill Moog. And second of all, I came to take you back to Long Genus. Run that one by me again, Trish. I came to take you back to Long Genus. Long Genus? Listen, there is no way you could say that word and not sound completely ridiculous. Malcolm McDowell couldn't do it. And he's fucking Malcolm McDowell. And the ridiculousness continues as she explains that she's after Ain't's red eye for her master, saying that it controls the power of the wind, and whosoever controls it controls the universe, because the wind must flow. But she has to go and break his sister's arm, I think. There is a crunching sound. But then she's never shown having suffered any injuries of a broken arm, but, you know, whatever. This sends Ain't into, well, you know. ancient times, there was a sacred star that was smashed by a hammer of the gods. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this anime keeps taking the words right out of my mouth. It's like it knows it sucks, and it knows that it can't do anything about it. So they move the plot along at a million miles an hour, all the while making all these snarky remarks about how much it sucks. Did I go back in time and write this heap? No, no, I would have chosen a better pseudonym than Orca. So, after he spends a good solid minute talking about backstory nonsense, he unleashes his full power. And how does this power manifest itself? As a gigantic arm made of Earth. He's earthbending. No, 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 he's just moving the Earth with air. Totally different. The power of the wind is a gigantic earthen arm. Well, at least now we know why the earthbenders can only muster up a single pebble. And with this awesome power, Ain't ain't gonna do a damn thing. Vanessa blasts off to safety and he just fucks right off, waking up in the home of Izzy. Oh, and can you tell that Shiro Masamune designed these characters? Hmm. Only one of your eyes is red, the right one. Eh, one of them is a fake because he lost it in an accident. And since then, he's only been able to see the past in one eye and the present in the other. He thinks he can only see patches of reality, never the whole picture. Which is why he lost his license. Just when you think this anime couldn't wait to get itself over with, it pumps the brakes and comes to a crawling pace. How bad is it? When Vanessa gives her leader the bad news that she let him escape, they flash back to this same scene only five minutes later. Further, it's no hyperbole to say that Izzy here may be the most pointless character I've ever seen in fiction. He basically serves as a means to protect Ain't here when he was knocked out, but that's it. Like, is he supposed to be the comic relief? Relief from what? Boredom? Confusion? The need to press the fast forward button? The reason why I live in the desert and live like a hermit is because I would rather stay away from those kind of people. And besides, they use beetles from the south as part of their weaponry. <laughs> it is funny because he is an ethnologist and he likes beetles. <laughs> Tell me, what is the name of your village that was attacked by them? Sol. What? Uh, Zal? You mean Zal? That's all? Yes, yes. Ah! Uh, damn them! Not Zal, too! Ah! Ah! Zal! That is one area that contains many different kinds of beetle fossils! It... It feels like another me from a parallel universe is trying to take over my brain! What the fuck was that? I don't think anyone could salvage a breakdown over fucking beetle fossils, but must they cast this guy? He doesn't even sound like he's overacting. He sounds like a douchebag trying to mock someone else for overacting. Ooh, ah, ooh, I'm in pain because of beetle fossils. Ooh, ah, ooh. 
And guess who lampreys himself onto Aint and lives through the entire anime? Oh, fabulous day! Captain. Huh? They're not here, Captain. I see. Hmm. Hmm. They must have gone to Iction. What? But that's farther north. They have a head start. It won't be easy to find them. Why? You can apparently tell not only where they're going, but also when they left through the sheer power of bullshit. And if that weren't enough, you also have jets and flying mech suits. I think you clicked the easy button. In fact, the task of finding Aint is so taxing and difficult that she finds him helpless and defenseless in five minutes. And she gets his sister too as a bonus. Fuck easy mode, this is game genie bullshit. And that is some Shiro Masamune bullshit. It looks like Vanessa here shares a birthmark with Aint's sister and takes it upon herself to confront her about it. But as naked. This is supposed to establish that she and her are supposed to be long lost sisters, but all I can think is just how cold she has to be. I know that nudity seems to be a thing in most Masamune involved projects, but there always seems to be an outside reason for it. Here, this might as well be Megan Fox bending over a car. Volk. Uh, yes? Do you want to sleep with me? What? Right now, if you want, you can do as you like. And that might as well be me doing a Danny Thomas spit take. Of course, this revelation causes Vanessa to have a change of heart and realize that she's been working for the evil empire all along. So she and her boy toy plot a daring escape. Just who are you anyway? Wait, <sighs> this is Alan. Luda, she is my twin sister, Alan. This is Elan? It can't be true. It's a lie. It isn't a lie. It's true, Luda. Believe me, she has the same mark on her back as I have on mine. Yeah, and she'll get naked as a jaybird just to prove it. No, I am not getting over that. While the boy toy takes the three on a magic jet plane ride, Vanessa has some questions for her father. Am I your daughter, or am I not? <laughs> <laughs> you, my daughter. You only have to look at the color of your hair. Surely you've noticed the color of your eyes. In no way do you resemble me. <laughs> Gotta admit, when you put it like that, Vanessa does come off like a complete idiot. I mean, that'd be like if I thought me and Mark were brothers. I mean, like, you know, not the brother kind of brothers, but, you know, the, you know, familial kind of, uh, uh, brothers, that's exactly what I meant, and not just, the other. Just stop. Vanessa goes ape shit, but Daddy Dearest just ain't having it, and goes full beefcake to strike her down. He just mops the floor with her, tossing her ragdoll body like it was nothing, and then he does the unthinkable. Hihachi may have caught and broke an axe with his teeth. Don't tell me, but could this be the end? But Beefcake broke a fucking katana without moving a goddamn muscle. This guy has to have the meatiest, plentifulest balls in history. And that he lords over poor Vanessa, rubbing it in her face that he tricked her for so long is just icing on the cake. <laughs> I bet you regret the last 16 years when I pretended that I was your real father. But, as it were, Beefcake just isn't able to lay the latest smackdown on her candy ass, as Aint finally uses his wind powers like you'd think he would and saves her. But not for long, as Beefcake recaptures them during their attempted escape, as Vanessa and Aint are thrown from their crashing ship. Oh, and guess who's still here? Uh, what's going on? Well, Longinus has begun to move out. Begun to move out? What do you think that means? It means they've begun to move out. And you're Canadian. Meanwhile, Vanessa and Aint are washed ashore on some random godforsaken spit of land. The anime attempts to take an interesting route with the story, having these two characters try and come to terms with what Vanessa did to her own father. Well, it would be interesting if the writing wasn't... You're safe. You're safe too. I'm glad that you are. Thank you. Painfully awkward. 
You might imagine that such an exchange would be inevitable considering the previous enmity between the two, but there's a difference between naturally stilted and just plain stilted. At no point in the story does their relationship follow any kind of arc or progression. He has a problem with her for killing his father, and then he just kinda doesn't. CHARACTER DEVELOPMENT! God damn it. What are the other assholes doing again? So you say it's not a good idea if Soros is revived by the strength of the wind? That's right. But I just don't understand what the connection is with the huge hand and the wind. Yeah, that is a good question to ask. Wait, what the fuck? You saw that? Ain't used that hand power in the middle of his forest. Nowhere near you! You weren't even in the same biome as him! So it's not enough that you're completely pointless to the story, but you also have to ruin your own anime's continuity too? This may be the first time I've ever seen a character actively sabotage his own fucking show. They don't even answer any dangling questions that have yet to be addressed and instead wax poetically about the power of the wind. Hell, we're not even sure what Beefcake intends to do with the power of the wind, but I'll bet dollars to donuts that it's just another variation of taking over the world. Mm. I hate this fucking shit. So the two maroon numbnuts nearly get blown apart when Beefcake's jets spot them, but by pure coincidence, on this rock barely big enough to hold a ping pong tournament, they duck into a cave that has a wind shrine in it, and it magically wipes away the jets in a seizure-inducing spectacle. Just when I thought they couldn't care less about what the hell was going on in the story, they'd find new ways to flip me the bird. Oh, and speaking of giving me a D on the trumpet, we finally check back in with Beefcake, who has since removed what he calls the blue flow and the red flow. No, not that kind. From both Vanessa and Aint. My question isn't so much when did he do this, but rather, if he did do this, how does Aint still have the power to control the wind? Almighty oh, red flow. Almighty oh, blue flow. You belong together. You are now both one. You have joined and become one. <laughs> oh, looks like somebody liked that part in Dead Space 2. I don't know what kind of powers are going to be granted to him by doing this, but I can't imagine it's worth shoving crystals into your eyes. The dude can already shrug off a katana to the chest. What more could he want? Actually, you know what would be great? If he did that, but then he found out that's not how it works, and that he re charles himself for no reason? I sure hope you know how to play piano, beefcake! The news hits Ain't's sister through bullshit deus ex machina powers that Ain't and Vanessa are on their way to their location via the amazing Technicolor seizure beam, which means it's high time for them to bust out of there. Come on, open up, you rotten, stubborn dork! Ouch! That really smarts! Huh? <laughs> we did it! Yes, I know, but now you can get off of me. Oh, sorry. Were these characters played by aliens? How could they have no concept of comedy or timing? I don't even know what this is. It's too unintentional for anti-comedy, and it's too weird for playing bad comedy. This is... uncomedy. An otherwise normal comedic situation that is played amateurishly straight and exists only in a strange Nirvana-like state that can never be purposefully replicated. This is like if there was a scene where a guy slips on a banana peel, but it's played like a tragedy like he just got shot, and all the actors have never acted before. And English is their fourth language. The three make their escape by literally jumping out of the fortress, looking suspiciously like an independent spirit award, and landing without even a scratch. Normally, this would be cause for a Leon Award, but awarding anything to Landlock would be like gilding... I don't know, tepid air. The boy toy stays back and plays the sacrifice so that the other two can escape. How tragic. Where are we? We're in Zal. What did you say? Have you any idea why we're here? That's precisely what I'd like to know. It's all so very strange. At first, we drifted onto some island. It was there the Zoroans found us. We thought it was the end. And then, from out of the rocks, a figure of the goddess Ea appeared! There was a figure of Ea on the island? I know! Sounds stupidly convenient, doesn't it?
With the party finally reunited, and Izzy, they confront Beefcake, sporting some nasty-looking eyeball tattoos and a new power to control the wind that he holds for about five minutes. No, really, he mounts this awesome power, but out of nowhere, the island shrine lights up, Ain't Sister gets a blue eye, and he falls apart. You think I'm joking, don't you? But I swear by everything that is good and holy in this world, that is exactly what happens. Our villain is defeated, not through any effort of our heroes, not through his own incompetence or vanity, but because he just... loses. Ain't and his siblings did nothing to activate the sister's blue eye, it just happens. Not only that, but it's a total defeat! Beefcake's forces are crushed, his fortress crumbles to the ground, because something completely unrelated to what our heroes have done or are doing happened. <laughs> Oh god, this is just demeaning. This may be the single most pathetic villain death I have ever seen. How the fuck did this guy go from shrugging off a katana to the gut to being defeated by having the heroes just stand there? At this point, it's just a mercy killing and Vanessa and Ain't put him down. And they all lived happily ever after and eat my ass, Landlock. This is piss poor in nearly every regard. There are some interesting ideas here and there, and the art is nice to look at, but there's almost nothing connecting these ideas together, making for one of the laziest stories, and certainly the laziest ending I have ever seen. And where are the last Airbender references I was promised? It's hard to squeeze in these little nuggets when the power of the wind really just means earthbending. What the fuck was that about? <sighs> it doesn't even fucking matter. This was barely a blip on anyone's radar when it came out, and even that was too much attention for something like this. Time to let this rot in the back of your FYE where it belongs. Or at least until Discotech Media picks it up. Well, onwards and forwards, it seems, because next month is Tatsunoko Month, and we're beginning with a heavy hitter. Techno Man. Till next time. <laughs>